Good morning, Southside Bible Church. Peter, it's so good to have you, brother. I love you dearly. Well, I got my wish. We get to sit in the dark and wrestle with one of the most profound truths in the world. Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And I've just had so much joy this week meditating on that thought. Just picturing God coming to Abraham, saying, I'm going to bless you and the nations through your seed. And this picture of these animals being torn in two as they make a covenant and the two should walk through it. And and only God walks through it saying, I will do all the conditions necessary for me to bless you, Abraham, and all who will have the faith of Abraham. And Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the foundation of the book of Romans. Then I just picture this mountain shaking with smoke And the Lord descends upon Sinai and he gives the law to Moses. Keep this and you'll be blessed. You'll be brought into a land flowing with milk and honey and I will be your God and you'll be my people. Disobey and you'll be cursed, condemned, destroyed, slavery, bondage. And we follow this law for hundreds and even thousands of years. And no one is able to perfectly obey the law of God. No one could trust God wholly and fully and solely and obey perfectly this law. No one could love the Lord thy God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. No one, uh, even David, the man after God's own heart, commits adultery and murder. And we just keep following it throughout history. And in the fullness of the time, God sends forth his son into the world, born of a virgin, fully God and fully man. And he comes and says, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. Romans 10, 4, I I am the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. This law has been leading to a place and it's been leading to me. And if you want righteousness, it comes by faith in Jesus Christ. The law is finished. It's ready to disappear. That covenant that was made with Moses fades. Romans 3, this gospel now, Paul says, it establishes the law. It shows its value. It shows its worth by Christ fulfilling it. It's it's got value. It doesn't just disappear. And in Romans 3, 19 through 20, through the law comes the knowledge of sin and no flesh will ever be justified in his sight by you obeying this law. Jesus comes to earth and he fulfills all righteousness. He goes up on a cross for all of our unrighteousness. And he cries out, Te telestai. It's finished and the veil is torn in two so that we can now have access back to God. The torn veil is a sign of the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The way back to God has been opened up by a righteousness which is by faith and not by the works of the law. And I pray that you see this And now this morning, Paul will keep working out this beautiful argument and showing forth the glory of the gospel, the righteousness that comes by faith. And Paul says it's an epigenosis. It's a a full knowledge. When you see and get that Christ is this, that is the great salvation that God has prepared for us, that he kept the Abrahamic covenant and did all that was necessary to procure our salvation walking through those animals not for the Jew only, but for the whole world to all who will believe that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and we will let Paul unpack this even further in our hearts. Uh, I made a big mistake. I meant to get something so this wouldn't wobble the whole time, but just bear with me. Sometimes I get so excited, I feel like I'm going to throw it over, (laughs) and wobbling isn't going to help it, so let's let's pray for that as well. (laughs) Father, I do... I come before you and I thank you that Christ is the the telos, the fulfillment, the completion of the law. This law painted a portrait of a true son who would trust you and love you with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength and love the neighbor as himself. The one who would be a sacrifice, the true lamb of God slain. God, I thank you for this picture and portrait and this righteousness 
that only one could fulfill. And so God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't make enough of him. We can't praise him enough. We can't thank you enough. But God, thank you that he has come into this world and he fulfilled the law. God, thank you for the torn veil. Thank you that now we have full access to the living God as our sweet little girl just shared, Jesus is my best friend. Oh God, thank you for such a gospel. Thank you for reconciling sinners favorably to yourself. God, let us continue to unfold this by your spirit. Teach, I, I have so much joy. Your, your Holy Spirit delights to be a floodlight on Jesus Christ, to show him as the telos, the completion of righteousness in the law. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, shine that upon every mind and heart through the word of God this morning and let everyone find rest and the completion of the work of Jesus Christ. And it's in his beautiful name that we do pray. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Paul's presenting four truths that stirred uh, his heart toward the unbelieving Jews. Last week, we began in verse 1, the prayer. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is their salvation. I pray that we love the lost. We always are praying, asking God to save them, reveal Jesus. Paul says, I wish the Jews could say, Jesus is mine. And they love him and treasure him and believe. They, I just, Paul wants that for his kinsmen. And then the problem in verse two through three is I testify about the Jews that they have a zeal for God. So they're, they're zealous for the things of God and for his name and his law but not in accordance with epinosis, not full knowledge, not in the revelation, the understanding of the gospel. For not knowing about a God kind of righteousness, this perfect righteousness that he requires, and seeking then to establish their own. When you don't understand God's righteousness, you think that you can do your own, you can accomplish it, you can get there. So because of that, they wouldn't subject themselves to the righteousness of God, the one that comes by faith. They wouldn't bring themselves under this free gift that comes through Jesus Christ, but kept running to the law saying, I can do this. I can accomplish it. And our explanation in verse four, the provision, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's what they would not submit to. Christ is the way to get righteousness. He is the end of the law for the righteousness that God requires of his people. And then in verses 5 through 15 now, we look at the fruit of this beautiful completion that Christ is. And in verse 9, he says, we're saved. Verse 10, this righteous salvation. Verse 11, the one who believes will not be disappointed. Verse 12, God is abounding in riches for all who will call upon him. Verse 13, you'll be saved. Verse 15, we preach glad tidings of good things. It's just this salvation, this gospel that comes from the completion of Christ being the end of the law. And so what we'll do this morning, I want to give you a more detailed outline now uh, of verses 5 through 8 are what we're going to look at. And so Paul is going to personify two concepts as if they're speaking. And, and it's going to speak how, how legalism speaks in verse 5 and how faith speaks in verses 6 through 8. He's going he's gonna to let them speak to us. So let's look at our, our first point this morning. I think it's up there on the screen. How legalism speaks. Oh, would you look at that. And the verse is even up there since it's dark. So anyone who, who has bifocals like me and you just need help, there it is. But that's probably so far away. I hope you can even read it. So we're trying to help here, guys. <laughs> verse 5 for Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. And then in verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. And we will look at that at our second point. So in verse 5 and 6 now, you, if, if you diagram this, you, you have a righteousness that it says ek. Out of, out of the law, it, it's, it's a righteousness that will come out of law. And in the verse six, it's ek faith. It's, it's a, a righteousness that comes out of faith. So we're, we're con con contrasting two things, a righteousness that comes out of law and a righteousness that comes out of faith. 
And one will cause you to stand before God with a filthy rag, and the other will cause you to stand in his presence blameless with great joy. And so I want to let these two things speak to you this morning. There are two players that we're going to look at. And so Paul's going to prove his point of 10-4, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, by going to the law to show them this is the design of God. This is why he gave it. He's going to let the law preach to him what the law is preaching. And he's going to quote from Leviticus 18.5. Moses says, saying, okay, if you really want to justify yourself by law keeping, then let's see what God says about it in his law. Did God pull a quick one on Israel? Did he change his plan saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you by grace through faith. Here's this promise, and then I dropped the law on Moses at Sinai, and now you got to work to get yourself righteous, and now Jesus comes, and we're going to go back to a promise, as that's what's going on, and Paul's going to show that the righteousness that saves has always come by believing and not by doing. There's been no change in how you get saved. The law served that purpose well, is what Paul is going to show us this morning. So our context, as we begin to look at this, Moses is telling the people they need to keep the law in Leviticus. And if they keep it, he's saying, God will prosper you as a nation. Second Chronicles 7, 14, my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If you want to be saved by works... You must keep the law. And Paul's saying, God designed it. You must keep it perfectly. If you want to get there by being good and doing your works, keep it. Moses does not allow any person to dream that under the law, he can be saved in any other way than perfect obedience. Keep it. He doesn't tone down the law to suit our fallen state. He doesn't say, do your best. I'm just going to grade on a curve. Be sincere. Just, just be honest. Be, just tell everybody how bad you are, and, and that's enough. He that does these things in our verse shall live by them. God's blessing is contingent upon the performance of the law. If you want righteousness, by law, there's a requirement. Doing it perfectly. The law is broken at one point, James says, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. One single fault takes away the possibility of you ever being justified by law, and Adam has already given you that record. The hope of salvation by your own works, your own merit, is black, and it brings despair. The the lawyer runs up to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Well, to love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength to love him with all of your absolute being. If that's how you want to get right with God, keep it perfectly. But as Peter read this morning in Galatians 3, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. That's what the law speaks. If you're under the works of the law, you're under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. All things. The man who practices the righteousness, which is based on the law, he is the one who must do it. No help, unaided. The demands are squarely before you. Keep them. God's blessing is contingent upon your obedience. It's impossible. It's impossible for you to obey a God kind of righteousness. Yet our God, because of his infinite holiness and justice and who he is, he has to demand it. There's nothing else but perfect righteousness that can dwell in his presence or he's not God. And so he has to demand perfect righteousness if you're going to be brought back into his presence safely. Paul says, I don't nullify the grace of God. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Why would the Son of God hang on a cross if you could get righteousness by keeping the law? We have to cry out with top lady and say, not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. These for sin could not atone, thou must save. 
<laughs> in thou alone. In my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And so what does God demand of me? Black enough I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Naked look to thee for dress. And so my only hope is to be clothed in an alien righteousness, not my own, that Jesus Christ has come and performed on this earth in my place. That's how legalism speaks. I want you to hear it so clearly, obey it all, and live by it. If you've walked in here this morning trying to clean up and be good enough to get God's favor, I want you to realize you have to do it perfectly, and you will never be able to do that. God demands perfection. There is no curve. There's no mercy in it. Exacting and demanding and demanding and punishing everyone who transgresses it. But God said the soul that sins must die. Could my tears forever flow? These for sin could not atone. The righteousness of the law will keep me at a distance from God. If I stay on that bus, it will never drop me off at relationship with God. If arriving at God is, is my righteousness and my doing, it will never happen. That train will never arrive in glory. And so I just want to make sure you get that this morning. The Jews needed to be rescued from their law of failing, and they looked to law keeping as the remedy. They hung on that which would ultimately hang them. Do you see why I believe in total depravity? We're, we're, we're violating God's law, that's our problem, and we go to the law to try to fix our problem. And he's showing you that that's not the law. The law ends. It leads you to Jesus Christ for righteousness. That's the gospel. The law was to lead mouths to be shut in regards to righteousness before God. I can't answer. I have no defense. I got nothing good. It's got to lead me to a hill far away where, where it stood the Son of God on an old rugged cross to the faith that speaks of righteousness. It has to, to lead me to, uh, it, it, the law was not to lead me to my hands, but to the hands that were pierced through for my transgressions. And so guys, that's how the law speaks. Our second point then is how does faith speak in verses 6 through 8. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that's to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. <clears throat> but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we are preaching. But the righteousness of faith speaks this way. And there's some difficulty this morning in, in interpreting this verse. Paul is loosely quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 14. We're going to go look at it. And Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy 9 says, do not say in your heart. And there's only one place in the Old Testament that that is ever used, and it's Deuteronomy 9. And it's the, it's the promise of the deliverance of the people of Israel. To, to a land flowing with milk and honey and cities, and you'll be prosperous. <clears throat> so God warns them, do not say in your heart, when the Lord has driven them out, all of your enemies before you, and given you this beautiful land with abundance, don't say this, Israel. It's because of my righteousness. It's because of our law keeping that God did this. My obedience delivered me from my enemies. No, it, he's saying it's nothing in you that I have done this great work of salvation from your enemies and slavery and bondage. This blessing will not come because of anything that you've done, Israel. In fact, you've been rebellious for these 40 years that I've been leading you in the wilderness. It's not because of how good you've been. You've been nothing but stiff-necked and fighting me the whole way, worshiping calves. So don't let it come into your hearts that the blessings you enjoy are on account of your doing. The law says, don't presume on your righteousness for my mercy and kindness and deliverance. God's saying it was my doing and it was merciful. And so when we hear the word of righteousness, listen to Deuteronomy 30, 11 now. For this commandment, I want you to hear that, this commandment from Mosaic law, which I command you today, it's not too difficult for you. It's not out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, 
Who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Who will go up there and get the word of God? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. And so this is the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy 30. And in Romans 10, Paul says it's the law of faith, the gospel. And that's where it gets a little tricky that it's talking about Mosaic law. And now Paul's going to talk about this is the word of faith in Romans 10. So how does this work together? And so that's what we're going to work on this morning. Just a little context on these verses, and I think it will help us. The context, again, it's the judgment of Israel. They're going to rebel, and they're going to be sent into exile and judgment because they, they did not do what the law commanded them to do. But God says, I'm going to restore you in a later day. And in Deuteronomy 36, God says, I'm going to circumcise your hearts, and I'm going to restore your souls by a sovereign work of grace so that you may live. And then in Deuteronomy 30, 11, this commandment, it's not out of reach. It's, it's not beyond your understanding, Israel. It's my, my will for you has been brought near. So the Mosaic law is the, the will of God revealing what he wants and requires and desires of his people. And so I've given it to you, Israel, and you don't have to go up to heaven to get it. You don't have to say, what is, what is God's will? I gave it to you. I revealed it to you. Where's your will, O oh God? What is it? God's brought it down to you. He set it before you in Torah. Here it is. And it's not beyond the sea. It's not, you got to go out and find it. Human impossibility, it's been brought near. The word of the law, God's saying, I put it before you, that you may do it and enjoy the blessing of God. The promise of abundance to the one who keeps the law. And so Paul makes application now in Romans 10. <clears throat> in the Mosaic law that was given to Israel, let's go back now to Romans 10. What does it say? Verse 6. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Don't say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Who will descend into the abyss? So the old words of Moses are now replaced with the new work of Christ and the law of faith. And so the, the, righteous, uh, the right, righteous out of the law to, to the righteous that's now by faith is, is being replaced. And so Paul does something mighty. The things that God said he would do by your law keeping, he puts other things now in place of your law keeping in Romans 10. This is a big jump. It's beautiful. What's he putting in place of your law keeping? Well, now what he's putting in verse 6 is that Jesus Christ has come into the world. He came down and he's, he's the revelation of God, the Logos. He, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so God has made who he is known through Jesus Christ. And he went up on a cross and died and was buried. And in verse seven, he replaces it with the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that all who believe now will be justified. That Christ is the end of the law. So he's, he's replacing, if you keep the Mosaic law, you're, you're gonna get blessed. And now it's being replaced with Jesus came and kept it and fulfilled it and died in our place. And you're gonna get blessing. He did it all, and the abundance of blessing is by his doing. I love the replacement. Keep the law. Jesus kept it, and Paul's seeing its fulfillment, and he's proclaiming it to you in Romans 10. So look, that should, that should blow you away. I can't see your faces, but you should be saying, whoa. You look, you look, some of you look bored from what I can see. I don't get it. Paul says this, you don't need to go into heaven. That's to bring Christ down. He came down. God sent him down in an incarnation. He went from heaven to earth and the word became flesh. God has brought righteousness right out of heaven in the person of his own son. You don't have to find a way to go be right with God. God has brought his will of saving you right to this earth. Thy will, O God, I have come to do in Hebrews. His righteousness to you, just like he brought the law to you, he's brought the gospel to you in Jesus Christ. He's come near. Oh. 
Paul sees in the language of Deuteronomy a greater fulfillment of God's grace in Jesus Christ. I brought to you the will of my doing, but the great mercy is the work of Jesus Christ, that there's a righteousness now that comes by faith, and I brought him to you, and I brought him really near. And I so love this world that I gave my only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I gave him to you. Who will bring Christ down? God has done it. He has brought him so near. He's brought him near. And I need self-control to wait for verse eight, how near he brought us. And we're gonna look at that in a second. He sent him. And in verse seven, Who will descend into the abyss? Well, that's to bring Christ up from the dead. Who will go to the place of the dead? The sea was the the picture of death to the Jew. It was a grave. And who's going to conquer sin and death in the grave from the first Adam where he brought death into the world and it spread to all men? Who is going to bring Christ up from the dead? And the answer is God did. On the third day, up from the grave, He rose with a mighty triumph over his foes. The righteousness that is not found in men's doing, but it's found now by faith. And the one who came from heaven went to the cross and was buried and has been resurrected and seated at the right hand of God. It is is just what he promised Abraham. He went and he fulfilled every requirement in his son. God sent his son from heaven He crucified him and he raised him from the dead. So what was necessary for the abundant blessing of God and eternal life and all that he has promised was was to the one who came and fulfilled that law. And the law was demanding and exacting and blessing will come from its fulfillment. And Jesus comes and he fulfills it all so that now God can pour out abundant blessing on you as if you kept every detail of the law and every place you broke it has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. It was by his doing and his doing in his son, by the incarnation and the resurrection, by faith. I don't know how you can say it any clearer. By faith in Jesus Christ alone. And then Paul applies Deuteronomy 30.18 and Romans 10.8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we're preaching. This message that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. What does it say? The word is near you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. The word of faith that we're preaching. What does it say, my dear friends? It says there's nothing I can do. God has done it all in his son. It tells me the same word that the law tells me. I'm near you. I've revealed myself. Not to make demands that you cannot pay. I'm near you because the demands have been paid by a Christ that has come near into this world. He's entered it. And what I'm calling for is not merit and performance of your souls, but that it would come so near that it would go right into your heart but that you would bow and you would bend by faith to the Redeemer at his feet. The end of the law, surrender, uh, quit resisting and being uh, insubordinate. He's done it all. Submit to my righteousness. Jesus Christ, the end of the law, submit to it. Come under it, bow to it, believe it. Surrender your life to that. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. The law was near. It gave command and it promised blessing. But it is fulfilled and trumped by the gracious word of righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. The law demanded our work and our doing. And now by the work of Christ, Jesus has done it all on your behalf. So I want you to hear this. God came near and he gave a law which revealed righteousness and called for your obedience to it. And it gave you neither feet nor hands to be able to do it. 
Romans 8, 3, we saw we, we couldn't keep it. And the consummation of the law, the telos of the law is Jesus Christ and he has come near and he has fulfilled the law's demands. And now he gives us wings that we can fly and now keep the requirement of the law to love God and love others. This is where your heart and your devotion is to be Christ. It's just everything ends at Christ and he's where, where we just land and our hope and our devotion and our love and our worship obedience, it's all to that one. God brought his word near in the law and he brought his son even near and now he speaks grace to our hearts by a righteousness that comes by faith. God's gift of the law is to bring you to the one who fulfills the law in your place. So Deuteronomy 30 is the language of law, but the logic of grace. God did not put righteousness out of reach. He brought it so near in his own son. And all that is required of righteousness has been fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ and the death and the resurrection they tell us, die, it is finished. What God has done for the sake of our souls, no one is asked to bring an incarnation or a resurrection. God has done it. What a glorious connection that Paul made in this passage. So what do we do now? We receive it by faith. What has already been done by God? What must I do to be saved? Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There is no scale, hoping your good deeds outweigh your bad. There's no ladder to climb by merit. There's no course to run, no work to be done. Salvation is done by our Savior. The word is near. The word of faith is what I've been preaching since we began Romans. And this word produces what we're going to see in verse 9, that if you confess. How near is it? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. This, this, this gospel brings lordship. Jesus is Lord. I bow. I surrender. And if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. And we will just park on those next week. But how close did he come? Into our very hearts into our hearts that now have been made to believe and lordship and surrender and our mouths confess Jesus is Lord. He's come so near. He's come right into our lives, right into our hearts. It's, it's just not an external word. It went internal. He comes to the inside now and dwells there by his Holy Spirit. That's what we preach. Christ. We look at nothing else but him. He is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What does the righteousness of faith say? Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. My friend, it has been brought near to you this morning by his word. It has come so near as you sit here right now, it's come right into your hearing. And now what are you going to do with this word that's speaking to you, a gospel that can save your soul from all of your sin here this morning, that God has done it all in Jesus Christ, and he offers it to you by grace through faith to believe in him as the remedy. May it come into your heart and your lips this morning that you would just sit here quietly and say, Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead for my salvation. What will you do with Christ when he's come this near? You're judged already, he says, if you reject the remedy of the Son of God. To come into this world and do that work and now have a preacher present this right to you, he can't come any near. What will you do with the nearness of Christ this morning as the remedy for your soul? Will you receive him by faith into your heart and then by your mouth? It is near you, and you don't need to travel all over to find it. You don't need to take a trip to the Holy Lands. 
You don't need to go to seminary and sit under the best teachers. You don't need to climb Mount Everest and see God. You don't need to go sit in a confessional. You don't need to try to stack up your righteousness this morning. <clears throat> you don't need a minister or go be a missionary. To be married to Jesus Christ, you don't even need a justice of the peace this morning. It's so near, it's by faith. I take you as my bridegroom, forsaking all other, keep myself only unto thee. I rest in you alone, and you can be married to Jesus this morning by faith. It's looking at the one who has done it all. He's accomplished salvation. He bore the wrath of God for your sin, and he fulfilled all that the law required. Perfect righteousness. He died, and he was raised, and it is finished. He is so near. This is the message that we preach. You are not saved by you. You don't need to climb the ladder of the law to heaven. No matter how poor you are, how uneducated or how educated, how much of a sinner you are, how attractive you are or not, how popular or unpopular, how, whether you live in a slum or a sanctuary or a palace, none of that matters this morning. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. A child can be saved. We saw it this morning in our baptisms. It's not for the wise and intelligent, it's for the simple who will come to this place. It's all of grace through faith. And for Sean Killian and Peter Samuel, I'm going to close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. <laughs> Peter was trained at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, so this is a big deal for me. He said, oh, but this is a very blessed thing to have to say to you. I do not come today with a gospel veiled in mystery or shrouded in doubt. I do not bring a message which you cannot understand or receive Neither do I come with ifs and buts, but with this. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He that believeth and, and is baptized shall be saved. Whosoever believes in him hath everlasting life. This is as certain and clear as the utterance of that dreadful roll of thunder, which has just now left on your minds the thought, he that doeth these things shall live by them. The word is near. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. So as I close out, I'm going to skip up some of the things I wanted to talk about. But I, I think the, last, the thing that is on my heart the most is has your law of pursuit ended with telos? You know, has the law left you at the end of it looking at Jesus Christ? who has kept every jot and tittle. He's fulfilled all righteousness. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Are you still Jesus plus something you're trying to perform to get him to justify you, accept you, and love you? Or have you finally just come to the end, Christ alone? Christ alone. That's my prayer for every soul in here. One of the joys of getting old there's not many. <clears throat> I hear some, some amens from my dear sisters in the front. I kind of lost my brain with COVID, and it's, you know, it's, it's weird. I, I've been more contemplative than I've ever been. And so what, what am I just asking myself, what am I shooting at? When I finish, what is it I want to see here at Southside Bible Church, and I, I think I've come to the conclusion, it's, it's this, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I just, every time it happens that somebody gets it, there's a joy unparalleled in my heart that I can't explain. People who come to this church stuck under law for righteousness, when you finally find the freedom and the, the joy and the release that comes, I, I just... I love it. I had a man who was in prison for over 20 years. And on his deathbed, he, he pulled me close and he said, Pastor, I've done some really bad things in my life. I'm scared. How can I stand before God? 
And we just went over this glorious gospel again. And I just watched this peace overcome him. And the next few weeks, just entered into the presence of Christ, sweet, trusting, full of faith, looking away from anything in him. And it's just, this gospel is so beautiful. I got to watch my dad just, one time I said, Dad, if you stood before God, and he said, why would I let you in? What would you say? And he said, I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad. And then a few years before he passed, he said, the, the, only, the only answer I have is the merit and righteousness of Jesus Christ is my only hope. And I watched him uh, finish his race just so excited to go be with Christ because of this gospel. And, and he's been rewarded. I got a baptism a little while back. One of the little Langer girls it hit me so deep. Just little children who will come to the end and see Jesus as their savior and they love him. And they're his best friend. <laughs> I got to watch my daughter-in-law get baptized here just a little bit ago and her journey and grace and her say, it's changed my life completely. My brother Mike, who can't, hasn't been here for years because of sickness, saying I've never been more content in my life because of the fullness of Christ. My own marriage, when my wife says to me, one verse at a time for 23 years at Southside, I've just grown and treasured the fullness that Christ is the end of the law for all who, to, who believe and preparing her to breathe her last on this earth safely. And my own journey and what I preach, Christ has become everything and he's sufficient and he's a savior. And so what do I want? I want a people who say Jesus is all and that's all. He's my gift of righteousness. He's died in my place. And it comes to me not by the works of the law, but by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I have asked my wife to put a lot of things on my tombstone for those who have been around. <laughs> Take them all off. Romans 10.4 only on that stone. And just say that that the, the reason he lives is Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Oh, how I love Jesus. How then shall we call upon in him in whom we have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. Purpose of the church. This gospel is so beautiful. How are they going to hear it unless we go and tell them in our work tomorrow, our people going to North Africa, going back to St. Lucia, this message must be told, proclaimed, lived, heralded. It's too good to be the best kept secret. I pray that, that you would be set free from, from fear and the beauty of this gospel would just take over your life and let me just tell it to everyone and anyone and live the beauty of this gospel. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Let's pray. Oh, the end of the law. Thank you. I love my miserable journey under the law ended at such a beautiful place. The glory and the beauty of Christ who has kept the law perfectly, who gives me the righteousness that you require, Father. What, what gift of love. And I've blown it so many times and I can look at a cross for the one who bore the wrath for all my transgressions, past, present, future. Thank you, Jesus for being willing. Thank you, Godhead, for designing such a gospel, such a plan, calling us to yourself. You get all the glory, praise, thanks, and honor. And I pray that every heart in here says Jesus is all. He's my hope. 
He's my stay. He's my everything. He's altogether lovely. I pray in the name of Christ. Amen.